Welcome to the Small Powerful Things podcast, where we interview people about the small and powerful things that have changed their lives in big ways. I'm Jennifer Dillon with Bounce Back Generation. Today, we're continuing our series on the six building blocks for resilience. These are six things that we all need in our lives to help us heal and deal with stresses, challenges, and traumatic things that happen to us. So often, it's the small things that we do within these six areas that can change our lives for the better in profound ways. Today, we're talking about storytelling. Storytelling is all about being the owner of your own experience, not letting others define you. The opposite of storytelling is keeping secrets, not letting others in to learn about you and help if needed. Again, we own our own stories, so here today to talk about their own stories is R&B music producer Lil Reese and Kells, the creative force behind the YouTube channel Tales of a Black Girl. Lil Reese and Kells, thank you for being here today. And before we hear about your story, I want to learn from you about what you think of when you think of storytelling. What does it mean to you to tell your story? Why is it important? I think um, the storytelling is important because you can I mean, who better to tell your story than you? I feel like um, others listening to the story can learn from your story. Also, um, it's kind of is a therapy to get your story out there, you know, to get it out of your mind and just out. There's a little more to it than that, but I'll just say that so far. The importance of telling your own story is that you have control over your own story you have control on what you want people to hear and what you want people to see you you go through your own experiences you take lessons from that those experiences whether it's positive or um trauma um and you can relay that wisdom you know down the line um whether it's like generational whether it's through friends um, co-workers, but you can pass down that wisdom that you gained from your experience, um, yeah. exactly how you experienced it, rather than someone looking from the outside in, and you can just tell your, your own story. The, the most important thing is you telling your story, you know how it happened, and you can relay the information however you choose to. Yeah, you know, I think one thing that we have to recognize is, is especially nowadays, if you if you want to hear who's telling your stories, go look at the news. The but, people on the news are telling stories about things they have no idea what they're talking about. So they're telling stories about a whole culture, about a whole society, but, about a whole group of people, um, and assuming that they know. And if you don't own that story, other people are going to run away with it. And and so, yeah. So I want to touch on something you just said, Maurice, about how telling your story is a form of therapy. Um, yeah. How has telling your story, how has it been therapeutic for you? Yeah, for example, um, telling telling my story, for example, is not just something that's sitting in my head that I'm thinking about all day. You know, I can't get out of there because it's not, I can't get out verbally or whatever. So, you know, getting it out, getting it to somebody is like, I'm able to kind of have um, a weight lifted off my shoulder by being able to, you know, talk about it and just get it out. How do you, you know, you can't just walk up to someone and say, let me tell you my story, right? How yeah. is it that you're uh, finding the opportunities to talk about the things that have happened to you in a way that people are actually listening? Well, it's more on the minor scale. You know, you talk to your family, you talk to your friends, things like that. And even if you're telling somebody, you know, what happened to you today, that's storytelling right. at the same time. So, you know, um, it's something that we do. It's something that I've been doing my whole life. So it's nothing different, you know, now. What about you, Kels? Um, do you find that, you have places and people that you can talk, talk about your story and that where you get a receptive audience, people are listening and are respectful about it. Yeah. So I tell my stories in different um, ways, multiple ways. Um, And I, 
I never, and this just comes natural to me. Like I never just tell my full story, let's say on one platform. Um, I put it across many platforms. Um, and then if you really follow me, then if you put the pieces together, then you'll see a full story. Um, but I, I tell my story, you know, talking with family and friends that I absolutely trust um, with my emotions. Um, so, and that's really big with me is if I trust you with my emotional state of mind, then I'm as open as a book. Um, and then I also tell my story, like through my hairstyles that I get, like whatever I'm feeling, um, reflects in my hairstyles or like the way that I dress or, uh, like my YouTube channel tells of a black girl, um, or my music that I do, um, I write poetry. So it, it just all depends on what I'm feeling and how I want to express my story. That's great. That gets me to talking about how both of you are artists and you're using your creativity in order to tell your story. So I want to hear more about you, Lil Reese, and what your artistry is about. Can you talk about what you do? Yeah. Um, currently, right now, I'm a producer, a composer. I make beats. I've been doing that since middle school, but seriously, um, since 2015 to current. And I was a I was a visual painter at first, who I studied under my uncle uh, Malik Sanefru. I've been doing art and drawing my whole life, and that was actually what I was doing before doing um, the music. Before 2015, I was like, you can see um, paintings. I was art, in art shows and galleries. I was the youngest person in this uh, open art studio at the time. I was 15 years old. So what you both have talked about is so interesting that you can tell, you don't all, always just need words to tell your story. Yeah. And you always you also don't need to have an immediate audience because you can be telling your story by creating visual art. You could be telling your story by dressing a certain way and just walking down the street wearing, you know, wearing what you're wearing um, yeah. by by creating music, by um you know, by by talking on YouTube and and not just saying, hey, I'm going to tell my story, but you're talking about things that are important to you. We can tell a story about ourselves by how we're, well, how we're, our posture is. You know, if you walk in the room and everyone's sitting around with their shoulders slumped, there's a story there that can be explored. What's happening? What What's going on, right? So I, yeah. I think that um, that's really interesting. Is there something in either of your art forms that you're using that we just talked about um, that has a particular message about what what your life has been like or do you just kind of find something that's interesting at that moment and tell that story or is there a theme to your stories and your music and your art that you're making um so to answer your question for me tales of a black girl that has a specific meaning in storytelling um, and a message that I want to get across. And basically it's, it's about things that do not get talked about within my community. Um, for example, like anxiety, um, does not get talked about enough in the, in the black community. Um, and if it does, it's like shunned. It's like, oh, you don't have anxiety, just suck it up, you know, go on about your day whatever the case may be. Um, and so I want to break that down and say like, it's okay for us to have anxiety and you're not the only one who's experiencing these certain things that's happening within our community that doesn't get talked about. Right. Yeah, that's so important. What What about you, Larice? My All of my art, all of my music, I never went into it like, oh, I'm... I'm going to do this or I'm going to paint this. Everything is like how an artist can freestyle, a rapper can freestyle. I'm doing everything freestyle. And 
my uncle taught me, the one who taught me to paint, just like how he pushed out all these hundreds of paints still and everything is vibrant and look different, he always told me to remain creative. So I feel like when I think too much about something, oh, this, that, and the third, that's when it doesn't go, it doesn't flow right. So when I go into it and just let it flow, then I'm um, able to create easier. I'm able to express myself easier. I want to say that that's t- like what you just said about remain creative um, and yeah. like having that natural flow really resonated because I'll, I've been having trouble with my YouTube trying to figure out topics ahead of time. To, you know, yeah. to talk about. And I've been stuck. Like, I don't know what I want to talk about, but I know that when I get in front of the camera and, you know, and just press record, it something comes out. And then later I rewatch the video. I'm like, oh, wait, I like this video and the way that it just naturally came. And that's how I want my audience to view me as authentic and just yeah. You know, just being myself, and that's another reason why I don't really edit down my my videos either. I just give it raw yeah. footage. I like that. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that's that's definitely way easier. It's like even sometimes when people give me questions, I didn't I didn't do it inter- I've been doing interviews and things of that nature since 2015 when I started doing music and it started taking off. So even still to this day, if somebody asks me a question in the moment, it can stop me instead of me just flowing and giving them what it is. Mm-hmm. So, so we talked about, you know, the importance of owning your own story and the importance yeah. of being able to be creative around your story. And then what you guys are talking about now, which is the ability to be spontaneous about it, let that let the story almost come out from you instead of trying to make it a certain thing. But I want to give you also both an opportunity to just tell who you are in a story. And, and you know, I think of it this way, like if you were to go to heaven, right? And someone said, well, tell me about your life. What was it like? what would be your story? And I think the reason I ask that is because when we can look at our lives that way, we can almost see our lives like, um, like a myth, like mythology, like a heroic story. It's like, I was born and then this happened and then that happened and I had to struggle. And then I, you know, and that for us at Bounce Back Generation is this kind of um, trauma to resilience journey that we're all kind of on that life is pretty damn traumatic. Um, and it's mm-hmm. uh, there's so many unknowns and they come from inside of us and outside of us and all kinds of things come at us. And so storytelling is a way to kind of organize what is happening to us so that it makes sense to us and it, and basically gives our lives meaning. So we provide the meaning to the things that happen. Right. So given that kind of context that I'm that I wanted to share, is there a way that you can say okay, this is how I would describe my life if I were to be in heaven tomorrow and say, yeah, here's a story. I would say my story is like a roller coaster. (laughs) (laughs) There's ups, there's downs, and I'm terrified of roller coasters. I have, uh, I am super scared of um, heights. And, um, yeah, so there's ups and there's downs, but at the end of the day, at the end of the ride, I take my deep breath and say that it's okay. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's how I would say my life has been. Um, I was born to my mother and my father. Um, they were um, shortly after I was born, they split up. Um, and they haven't been on good terms since, and I'm a full fledged adult. Um, and so navigating that space has had its ups and has its downs. Um, but at the end of the day, like I'm okay. And I'm, I'm dealing with the situation the best way that I know I can. And, you know, in life, there's struggles. I've had my struggles. Um, And I couldn't put a name to my struggle because I might have been too young or didn't have the correct knowledge um, on how to navigate through it. 
Um, but here I am today. I'm an adult. I think I'm handling my life the best way I know can. I'm on the straight and narrow. Um, and that that's all that I can ask for. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I mean, that's a resilient story that you see the ups and downs. Instead of being in the wave, you're looking back at what happened. And mm-hmm. that, and then that helps you to think, okay, you know, I'm going to go up, I'm going to have a cycle again, or I'm going to go up and then I'm going to go down. And I know that this is how life goes and, and, and I'm going to manage it because I've been able to do it in the past. So I think that's yeah. a really empowering story. How about you, Lorise? How would you kind of characterize your, your, your life story? If you were to like, uh, talk in heaven. I'm still on the path, but I came all the way from the bottom to being somewhere that nobody can even imagine possible coming out of our neighborhood. Long story short, I'm going a, I'm to a give you a story, but it was definitely a roller coaster ride, like Shane said. Like, you know, I think uh, anybody, anybody who's been in, I think, uh, like urban communities and stuff, it hasn't always been the easiest ride. And my mom, she has five kids. It's me and four other brothers, one older, three younger. And um, both my parents, so that's seven people in the household. And, you know, we struggled. We lived in the projects starting out. We not in the projects no more, but, you know, uh, just never just certain things just growing up that you know um that you wish that you would have had getting tapped on at school but also i'm like the neighborhood superhero because everybody knows me and all my brothers can do backflips and acrobatics and this that and the third so it'll be like any anywhere i went any school any community they always hey that's Hey, bro, hit a backflip. So it was like being a superhero because everybody couldn't do that. I was probably like one of the only two people on the block that can do that. But since my whole family can do stuff like that, then, you know, we kind of was looked at like that. Then um, coming up when we got to, when I got to middle school, that's when we moved out the project. So, you know, life started progressing and getting better and things like that. Um. 2012, I moved out of my mom's house. I was gone until about 2017, came back, came back for a year, and uh, I did what I needed to do. I got a deal. I moved to L.A. by myself. I started, you know, being a responsible adult, you know, came back in. And I brought it home and I do it for my family. I do it for my community and ones that I love around me. So um, life is great right now. I would say that. So that's a story that I want to hear because it's what I would term a success story. How do you do that? How do you go? uh, I mean, how old were you when you moved to L.A. and you said, "Okay, I want to go make music. I want to produce. I want to make beats and stuff. How did you? What did you do? Because that's a really almost impossible uh, world to break into. Before let me, let me Larice, hmm? wait, Loris, before you answer that, I want to ask you a question. Um, yeah. Remember, we was working together. I'm not going to say the place online. But nah, remember, we, um, okay, we we used to work at the Exploratorium together, and we yeah. were having um, a conversation um, when we was at work and. You were you asked me uh, what was my advice on um, what what you should do. Should you continue working at the Exploratorium or should you just stop and um, go full fledged doing music? Um, And I I just want to ask you, like, do you remember that conversation that, you know, that we was having? Because I I know I told Jennifer about it. Like, yeah, I remember he asked me. Um, when one time we was working, like, what, uh, what do I think he should do? And, um, this, that, yes. and the third, and you decided to go full fledged music and, and now here you are the, the super producer. I definitely remember that conversation. And, um, 
I would just like contemplate and think to myself, like, you know, I don't know how life is going to turn out. If I quit my job, I'm already working here. I'm making sufficient money to sustain myself at the time. So it's like, that's a whole great area that I'm jumping into, just jumping all the way into it. But it just got to a point where when I was coming to work, it was like I was taking off so much. And, you know, Sylvia and Sal was very, those was the, I would say, the coolest supervisors I ever had. I come mm-hmm. in, I tell them, even though they know, like, hey, you have to be at work. I'm like, hey, um, I'm going out of town because X, Y, and Z about the music. Like, is it cool? And they always, they never told me no. They all, I never, you see how much I was taking off work, Mm -hmm. but it just got to a point where I'm like, there's no way that I can still work a job. And all these people is hitting me to go out of town, do this, that, and the third. Like, I can't do both. Yeah. So I just have to just come to the realization, like, it's now or never, because the the stove is hot. So it's like, I, I don't know. If this is what I should do for weeks, for months, I was thinking about this and it was like, uh, I feel like this is the right decision and look where I'm at now. So I, I want to hear how you how you broke into that industry, but I just want to make a point here about that um, those decision points. A lot of times yeah. when we tell our stories, it's about like, okay, this and this and this was happening. And then one day I just decided I was going to go for it. Or I decided I was going to quit or whatever. And those those are these like huge moments where you just totally shift your your direction. It's like taking another fork in the road. And it's so important. So so let's hear about how you actually broke into the the music business, um, because that's a that's a definite struggle to success story. Yeah, well, basically, so to start, um, nobody was even. Caring about, oh, bro, you make beats, you do this, that, and that. Oh, bro, hey, let me send you some beats. Oh, thinking that my beats going to be weak. And around that time, the internet wasn't really that big yet. It was like people was on Instagram and stuff, but not, it wasn't that big. So at that time, you know, uh, I hit up one of my homies that we used to go to school together, and I'm like, I see you doing your thing, rapping. I'm like, um, and you pretty good. I'm like, let's throw something together. He like, all right, send me some beats. Sent them the beats. After that, he told me that his whole neighborhood was going crazy to them beats that I sent. <laughs> after that day, after me and him put out that song, it was like, the city was going crazy trying to figure out who is Lil Reek. Then I did another song. Now it was only two songs out. From that, then the Bay Area was like, who is Lil Reek? Then all these major artists from the Bay Area start tapping in with me. I am Sue, Cool John, p like, you know, every g Easy, all the people from San Francisco, Lil Yace, um, G-Val at the time, every, like, anybody who was hot at that time in the Bay Area was tapping in to get beats from me at that time. So um, let's tell us what those songs, the names of both those songs, and then we'll we'll put them, if it's okay, we'll put the link to the YouTube um yeah. videos that you have in in the description so people can hear them so what are those what are those two songs that really just broke it out for you the first song was no Lil Yates Fed that was yeah um, I was gonna say it was Feds yeah Feds then uh the second song I did it was G Baby Gang so so tell me where you are now in in that process what are you what are you up to now um you know, just collecting platinum and gold plaques at this point. <laughs> Billboard no, magazines, real. two years in a row, things like that. Well, congratulations. It's a that's thank a fantastic you, story. And that's an inspiring story. What would you tell someone who 
said, look, I'm, you know, I'm a teenager. I, I love making beats. It's something I want to do. What, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, the advice that I give them is there is, is not going to be overnight success. You have to stay honest if this is what you really want to do and go through with it all the way through the ups and downs. And you have to sacrifice and make the commitment. And, you know, that's just what you got to do to get where you're trying to go. You know, I feel like um, a lot of people and a lot of young producers hit me up that's, you know, aspiring and things like that. And they'll get, they'll get a little momentum going. And then when they feel like they're not getting uh, the reception that they want from everybody else and, oh, this is not popping off for me. And, but I just did one song or two songs. Like, you know, stay on it, be consistent. Like I said, through the ups and downs, 2017, for me, that whole year, I had I went all the way back to square one. No studio, no car, no nothing. And it's like, through all that, I still found ways around that to continue to keep doing what I'm doing. I was making beats at home at the time, right, on my mom's table. Every time I had to sell a beat or do anything, I had to book studio time at somebody else's studio, and I'm paying them a chunk out of what I'm making just to keep doing what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, you got to just can't give up. Yeah, I was just going to say, that's a don't give up story. Never yeah. give up, never give up, never give up. And, um, yeah, I I those are some of my favorite stories are when people just keep persevering, persevering, and then finally it all comes together. What about yeah. you, Shay Kel? Do you have like a, a success story kind of the way you see your, cause you're very successful at what you do. What's, what's your success story? Well, you know, I go back and forth with the word success mm -hmm. because, you know, society has its version of what success looks like. And then right. the reality of what the success is for me, it depends on the person um, and what they define as success. So my success story is that I am able to provide for myself through hard work, mm -hmm. um, which means that I have my own apartment, I have my own car, and you know, and I'm taking care of my everyday needs and wants by myself. I'm mm -hmm. independent. Mm -hmm. um, and if and of course, you know, I'm not saying that I don't need help sometimes, <laughs> or I may not struggle sometimes, or I may not have to sacrifice this to pay this or whatever the case may be but i'm i'm independent and i'm basically doing what i want to do yeah. um yeah so that's that's my definition of success and my success is i i'm i'm here in my own apartment <laughs> driving my own car i can go wherever i want to um gas permitting considering that the gas is seven dollars a gallon <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm able to do whatever I whatever I want to do. So you got an independent story. Yeah. There that, that's your your not a success story because you 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 define the way you're defining success is independence. Yes. Yeah, I tend to be like that too. So um I want to put this now together with what it is that bounce back generation tries to help. Uh, folks to understand about themselves. And the what's really important about storytelling, it's part of a package of, of tools that we like to share with people. And that's our six building blocks for resilience. So let me just walk through those. And um, I just want to kind of show how each building block fits together and how storytelling is the last one and how it can, if you kind of put them all together, they kind of become this foundation with which you can build your life on. So the first building block is protection. And um, 
and you might have a story about how you were not safe at some point in your life and you found protection. So you want to think about uh, the, the, the reason why protection is number one is because it's the basis of how we um, function in life. If we're not safe, if we don't feel protected, that's where anxiety comes from. It's where um, we get our fight or flight feelings and freeze feelings, all those um, stress basically comes from not feeling safe. So number one is safety. Number two is, is relationships. And both of you have talked in your stories about relationships for good and bad and how they've supported you um, or not. Or like, uh, like Kels, you said that your um, the relationship between your mother and your father was uh, a source of stress when you were growing up. Um, but having strong relationships and having at least one person you can go to is a really important foundation that we all need. Um, it, we call it our in case of emergency person, someone you can call up when you need something um, emotionally. The next thing is coping skills. So having um, coping skills that you can uh, reach for, when, especially if you're feeling physically and emotionally upset. Um, so things that you can uh, reach for that are not going to make you feel bad the next day. So, you know, we tend to reach for things like, you know, drugs or alcohol or risky things that make us feel worse. So finding good coping skills that help us feel better. Um, next is belonging, feeling like you belong somewhere and to some group or to some, you know, cause or something is really important. It's how we're built to be part of a, a group. And then the finally is storytelling. So storytelling kind of puts everything together so that you can recognize for yourself what whether you have those things in place or how those things of not having those things could have affected you. Um, and that's where I want to come into the concept of trauma. And when you've had traumatic things happen in your life, how you tell the story about those traumatic things. Now, I'm not asking you to share necessarily a traumatic story um, that you have put into context, but just to share with the audience how you might put together a story after something really traumatic happened. And if you need an example, I can, I can give you an example. Well, I have a, a story. Um, so to go back to um, the relationship building block. So when um, all my life, my mother and father have not been on good terms. And the one person that I had that was very neutral in that, um, and that during that time was my aunt. Um, and she's the one who helped raise me um, all in a nutshell. And then she passed away in 2010. And so that was a very traumatic experience. Uh, she died from um, breast cancer. She had breast cancer. And I actually watched her take her last breath. Mm. Um, and I decided, like, in that moment, I decided that that's what I owed her, um, was to be there until her very last breath. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that. And that day has changed me so much. Um, and I didn't understand because I was a little bit younger and I wasn't um, as in tune with my feelings as I was or understanding, you know, what was going on. Um, and so I was just like angry all the time. I didn't know, um, why I was angry. I was just, just really angry and I didn't trust nobody like parents, grandparents, friends, like close family. I didn't trust anybody. And I isolated myself for a very long time, um, and coming out of that situation, and I'm still um, addressing some of those feelings that I was feeling back then because I suppressed them for so long. It's been like 12 years. It'll be 12 years in August. Um, but I understand, I understand now why I'm so angry, <laughs> you know, and... What, what brought friend. you to that understanding? How did how so did I wouldn't I wouldn't talk about her at all. So I didn't talk about her for the first couple of years that this happened. Um, anytime that she had got brought up, her name would get brought up. My body would tense up mm -hmm. so bad, um, 
And I would just like disassociate with whatever it is is going on around me. Mm -hmm. Um, I would block it out. And now I'm able to talk about her, as you can see. Um, And I still like my body still tenses up a little bit, but it's not like I'm a brick, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like how I was before. And so for me, getting past that was talking about her in good ways, how I felt, um, what she did for me, um, how important she is in the person I am today. Um, Yeah, so just like talking about her. What I think you're showing is something that's so important that, you know, especially when we're young and things, but anytime something overwhelming happens to us, it's that thing where because you're in it, you're, it's like, you're the fish in water, you know, you're, you're the fish in the ocean. You don't know, you have absolutely no ability to kind of rise above and say, oh, I'm swimming right now in this really awful thing. And I have no objectivity. I don't have any way to kind of step outside myself and say, oh, look at what I'm going through. I, you're just in it right? Mm -hmm. You're just experiencing it and you're kind of going through the ups and downs and not really aware of it. And that ability to, to then become objective and say, oh, what am I going through? Is that storytelling process, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and then every time you tell the story, you might have a different insight into yourself. And what's hopefully what we do when we tell our stories very consciously, what we try to do is to try to see ourselves in a gentle and loving way instead of, well, I should, my, my aunt passed away and I don't know why I didn't just like bounce back up and get up and do whatever needs to get done. But that you lovingly saw that I was, you know, young and, and it was so overwhelming to me that I didn't have any objectivity about it. Mm -hmm. And, and also with the, pressure of in the black community of you know you're you're strong you can deal Mm -hmm. with it you know pull yourself up by the by the bootstraps and it's like no like I'm human I have feelings and Mm -hmm. you know I have bodily responses that you know I need to address and come to terms with and yes I am strong but that doesn't determine how much I can take you know I totally agree with you. I was just talking to my little homie last week and he told me like all the stuff that he was going through, all type of, he like, bro, I can't even tell you the last time I cried. And I'm like, why? But you know, and especially a black man is like, Mm -hmm. bro, suck that shit up. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and with the, and with a a black female, um, it's like, you know, you're this nurturer, so you have to take care of everybody around you. Um, And then once you do that, then you can address yourself. And it's like, no, how can I take care of everyone (laughs) if I can't take care of myself? If I'm not okay, how can I take care of the next person? Like that, to me, that's not giving my 100% full self. If, If I'm just like stuck here and I'm trying to help the next person, you know? Right. Yeah. So what about you, Lil Reese? Do you have uh, like a, a a way of approaching how you look at, you know, your own traumatic stories or do you have something you want to share in that in that way? I feel like anybody who's living is like we all go through trauma and it's just recognizing it and being honest with yourself at the end of the day. Um, my uncle, who I actually have tatted on my left hand. My uncle was literally my best friend. Like he used to come over to my house every day just so we can play football and talk shit and do this, that, and the third. This is my mom's older brother. In uh 2013, he um he came down with um congestive heart failure, the same thing that his mom, my grandmother, passed away from. Mm-hmm. And um, it just took him straight out, like, within, like, three, four months. Oh, and, wow. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was quick, and it was bad. Like, it used to, um, 
he used to really mess me. Like even him just trying to talk and seeing how much he used to struggle just to talk because like I, his heart is just getting bad. And I remember I was on my way to Antioch. Now I don't even go visit people in the hospital, this, that, and the third. Something inside of me, I was on the, I was on the freeway from the get on the bridge. Something told me to go to that hospital. And, and I went there. My mom and my cousin was there. And uh, he ended up passing away maybe about two, three hours after I got there. And uh, I was holding his left hand as he was taking his last breath. So um, I got his name tatted on my left hand. Just like I said, I feel like Anybody who's living go through trauma, but it's just how you deal with it and move on from that. And I just be real and honest with myself. And I can come to peace with things when you, um, you know, like just come to the reality about it that, you know, this is life. Things happen. You know, it hurts. I'm dealing with it, but life keeps, life keeps going on. It's like, as long as I have life in my body, I got to do it for me, my family, and the ones that aren't here and the ones that are still here. So, Wow. It's interesting that both of you have stories of, you know, aunt, uncle, and both of you have stories of being close to them and having this really meaningful relationship. And both of you have experienced them dying in your, in your arms, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And that's, and yeah, and that's why we were friends, huh, Lil Reese? <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, they remember people when we was at work, people used to think we was related. <laughs> yes, they, yes, because uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you've seen on the video, but people say that we, um, we was at work that we looked alike. Yeah. <laughs> so we started calling each yeah. other cousins. <laughs> and it's funny because me, I met Shane. I don't know what grade you was in, or you could have already been grown at the time. But I'm talking about the safe haven that was at Jolie Gym. That was like what 2004 or three or something. Yeah, something, something like that. Yeah, like 2003. Yeah, because I was just going into high school, and this is what I was telling Jennifer too. I said I met Lil Reese when I was way like as a kid and I was like and he has right. stories about some right. things that I said but I don't remember it and right. I right. when we reconnected in high school because I used to coach you know one of the um one of his ex-girlfriends and we met again through that way and then he approached me like you don't remember me like you don't remember you said this and this and on this trip we went to Disneyland <laughs> together and everything and I just don't remember <laughs> i didn't remember and i still to this day don't remember but i'm glad that we reconnected and we have this you know friendship to where i can call and ask like hey Laurice, you want to be on this podcast and he's yeah. like yes for sure well there you go sometimes uh other people share in our stories with us and i i think that's so important that we're a uh, you know, we're going through life with other people and they're, they're characters in our story and we're characters in their story. But I also have to say, I have friends like that that I've been friends with for a long time. And they'll say, remember that time you did? And I'm like, no, I did <laughs> not do that. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah, you actually did. You know, normally I, at the end of the uh, podcast, I always ask uh, who made a difference for you in your life. But both of you have already told us in your story who yeah. is someone who made a big difference in your life. So I think you've covered oh, that. I got to give life. one more shout out before we get off here about somebody making a big difference in my life. Brent Fires, that's my brother. And uh, Ty Basin, that's his manager. And Ty, man, I he done been with me through thick and thin, everything. He done looked out for me, then changed my life, then changed help, changed my life to help my family and change their life. So well, know, tell um, can you tell us a little bit more about what, what he was able to do? 
to and tell her my Bank of America is. account got six figures. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, when you stay down through through it all, and it just build up, and it's it's cosmic, you know. Yeah, and Brent but, Fires is an artist that is really breaking through right yeah. now. Yeah, probably the music. one of probably the biggest R and B singer of our time. Like, yes, he's really hot. I feel really old right now. <laughs> <laughs> My, my son is my son's 15 so if i know who any of this is he's gonna stop listening to it because it's gonna be like tainted you know? <laughs> thank you lil reese and kels for sharing so much of yourselves not only today but in all the ways you show us how to tell our stories if you'd like to learn more about the other building blocks for resilience they are protection relationships coping skills can do and belonging please listen to the full podcast series or visit our website at bbgtv.org i'm jennifer dillon with bounce back generation thanks for listening we're glad you're here <laughs>